For 60 years we've debated, but no answer. Finally, the debate can come to an end. This year, we have been given a sign. So, Rabbi Rosenberg asks, which is better, the latka or the hamantashen? Surely, whichever pastry would be favored by Avram Avinu, Abraham, the first Jew, would be best. As it happens, the portion of the Torah I read this week speaks to this precise question. <laughs> it's true, and it's no coincidence, because we know there are no coincidences in Torah. In Parshat Vayera, also known as Parshat Varka Hamantashen, strangers come to Avram and he greets them with his legendary hospitality. He calls to his wife, Sarah, Hurry, three siyahs of meal, fine flour, knead and make cakes. Genesis 18, 6. We know our patriarchs would give only guests the best, so the question is, was the best vodka or was the best Hamantashen? We know it must be one or the other because we read the Parsha this week, the week of the vodka Hamantashen debate. <laughs> So, Rabbi Shemai teaches that as Abraham said, bake cakes, we must prefer latkes, which are pancakes. But Rabbi Hillel teaches fine flour, which means we eat flour heavy hamantashen. Oh, wait, excuse me. I'm the law professor. Excuse me, this is wrong speech. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you give a guy a black coat and he starts talking funny. You know? You give, a, you give a guy a black hat and then all of a sudden it's tour, tour, tour. <laughs> so what's great about the Wattke Hamantaschen debate is that at a time when so much academic inquiry is spent on esoteric and irrelevant matters, <laughs> the debate focuses our energies on the big questions. But there's a danger here too. There is something about the debate that creates the temptation for otherwise sober scholars to fudge facts, perhaps even to make things up. <laughs> I'm not saying that this has ever happened here, just that it's a danger. It's hard to say what it could be about the debate that creates such incentives. Perhaps it's the absence of double-blind peer review. As, long, as law professors discovered long ago, if you only have to satisfy a group of students with your argument, you can get away with anything. <laughs> So I would like to assure you, in all seriousness, that you can put this concern aside here. All legal citations you are about to hear are accurate. Look them up. In 1789, as part of the statute creating the federal courts, the first Congress passed the Alien Tort Act, now codified at 28 U.S. Code Section 1350. It allows district courts to hear alien tort cases involving violations of international law. No one knew exactly what this meant. The statute has no legislative history. As a federal judge put it, it's a legal longer and no one knows whence it came. This makes it attractive to law professors who can thus say anything about it without any danger of refutation. So opaque was the statute that no court relied on it as a basis of jurisdiction for the 180 years after its enactment. But in 1980, Judge Irvin Kaufman on the Second Circuit Court in New York dusted it off and said the statute authorized federal courts to decide cases involving human rights abuses, even if they were committed abroad and have no relation to America or Americans. So, for example, Paraguayans could use U.S. courts as a forum for adjudicating the human rights abuses of that country's military junta. This was, to put it mildly, a broad reading of the statute. <laughs> broad enough, perhaps, to encompass the current controversy between the Rothka and the Hamantashen. <laughs> For consider, latkes and hamantashen are clearly torts. <laughs> it is hard to say which is more of a tort. On one hand, the hamantashen shares the tortuous feature of sweetness. Yet the latka is, as a tort should be, a type of cake, a pan cake, as we have seen. And both are certainly alien torts. The latka hailing from Poland, the hamantashen from Persia. And eating them, as we are about to discover, is certainly an act. Thus far, all of the requirements of the statute have been satisfied. Alien, tort, act. This must be precisely what Congress had in mind in 1789. The only question left, then, is whether either or both of these alien torts violate international law. A good way to frame the question, while casting light on important and serious current debates, is whether it would violate customary international law or the Geneva Conventions to feed enemy combatants, lockers, or hamantashes. 